Are you all ready? <laughs> no. What does it no. say upside down? Yeah, Ria, Ria, no, or rib no. Uh, okay, so I have a really half-baked idea today, and so I just want to walk through it. So the goal today is to get to this half-baked. I didn't even want to call it a hypothesis. So I said, well, hypothesis last idea, and I don't even understand it myself. So, but I think it was worth just trying to describe it and maybe I get some feedback about how to think about this. Um, so the goal is to go through a bunch of stuff that's semi-review, a bunch of questions, and then try to get to this idea. Is this what Lucas and I erased the other day? With that question just came up a moment ago and I said, I don't know because you erased it. <laughs> so, and Jeff doesn't remember. <laughs> remember. Okay. So it is related to it because I was thinking about different types of representations in the cortical columns and talk of SDRs and their meanings of them, but not specifically this stuff. So uh, I'm going to start with a, like a review of things, but for some of you guys it won't be much of a review, it might still be new things. So um, I'm just thinking about a single block of cortex, just generic cortex, column if you will, and um, we can say, okay, what's the goal of a block of cortex, a column of cortex? And, the way I like to talk about it, the goal of that thing is it's to learn a model of the world. It, it gets some input from some place. Um, it doesn't, if it's generic cortex, it doesn't know what that input represents. It has no idea what it represents. It doesn't know its modality. Um, it doesn't know uh, uh, anything about it, really. It just says, here's some input, and I'm trying to build a model of this as it changes. Uh, it might change on its own, but also it mostly changes through movement. So we learn a model of the world through movement. So it's basically as, as some, the inputs change, as something's moving, and it's trying to figure out the structure of that thing. Uh, we know that um, it's a predictive model, uh, meaning it predicts uh, whatever's the next input, and therefore it must have some copy of the motor command. That's the efferent EC, it's efferent's copy, that's a neuroscience term. Efforts copy motor command, so it must know something about the movement, otherwise it couldn't predict what's going to happen. We have struggled with, by the way, um, understanding, we don't really understand where that motor efforts copy comes from. Um, where it's not documented, and it's like it's not clear where that shows up here. It's very clear where the input shows up. The input comes from something, it goes to the thalamus and it projects to layer four, a couple other places too. Um, but this green thing, the motor inference copy, is kind of a mystery. We spent a lot of time talking about that. We do know a lot about the output of this thing, and the goal, the goal of this column is not just to learn a model, because what's the point of just learning a model? The purpose in the end is to use that model to create behaviors. And so once you have a model of the world, not only can you predict the future, but you can say, oh, how do I get to a particular state of that model? How do I get to the particular position in space? And actually, I make a distinction between location and state because things have states. I always talk about my phone. My cell phone has a state, and I want to get to some state, uh, some particular state. I have to do a series of actions to get to some state. Or, or, yeah. Good question: Isn't the thalamic input the reference motor copy from the previous? Well, I didn't region? draw that here. <laughs> okay. If I think about a primary motor cortex, a primary sensory cortex. Yeah, you want to be one. Yeah, but so so this is an issue. That I purposely didn't talk about the problems of uh, multiple. Right. Yeah. So you you could argue <laughs> yes. Well, you could say if I had if this is another column here, and here's layer five, uh, then its cells come out and they go into the thalamus of this column, something like that. Yeah. But we never really understand that either, because in the primary sensory cortex, that would that would imply the input from the retina is a motor command. And we've actually, I've actually spent a lot of time thinking about that. And could it possibly be viewed as a motor command? And so I'm getting closer to that problem here, but I didn't want to address it over here. Okay. So there's also kind of where, where, what, where pattern yes, connections. I, yes. So the motor cortex projects to. Yeah, I know, but we've seen projections all over the place. My point is, we don't really understand that. Um, it's, it could be that there's a, I'm not saying it doesn't exist, we've talked about it, there could be this layer six, the layer six connection we've talked about, which could be the efferent motor command. Um, uh, it could be, you know, this output through the thalamus. None of these things quite make sense. All this. So I'm just, I just said to myself, let's just focus on a single column, and let's, talk, let's focus now on like a primary sensory column. So, um, 
Uh, and I just put this here because we just don't really know exactly where it's from. We don't really understand it in detail. We know it has to exist uh, for this column. And I'm going to come back to this a moment later. I didn't really want to focus on that part right now. Um, so, uh, so again, it's a, we, it's the goal of all this, we have some movement command, we have some input, we generate a model of the, we, we, this thing has to learn a model of space that this thing is looking at. It doesn't know what it's looking at, it doesn't know what, it doesn't know what the world is like, it just says here's a bunch of bits coming in, and here's a bunch of motor commands, and they're changing, and I have to figure out what is the underlying structure of this thing that I'm observing and I build a model of it. And we've talked a lot about what that model looks like. The model's going to be built on locations. Um, uh, and I'm not going to go further into that today. But you can just imagine this sort of three-dimensional CAD model of something in the world that says, oh, I've discovered the structure here. But this is very generic, because this could be some high-level cortex doing language and uh, not getting sensory input directly. So this is the general idea. And I think you could say generally the purpose of the column is to learn this model and from that create behaviors um, that, uh, that allow you to get to some go uh, reach a goal, which is some location in some state in the world. Um, and of course, you have lots of columns doing this. We have an, then we can talk about the input to the column here. So you get a bunch of bits coming in that you don't really, this column doesn't know what these bits represent, right? The meaning of these bits, it's, it's just an SDR. I'm talking about this. Thing right here, this thing that's coming in. It's just some sort of number of bits, some are active, some are not. The meaning of them are unknown, the modality is unknown, doesn't know if there's a sound touch here and some other part of the cortex. The dimensionality of the world that it represents is unknown. For example, often uh, our, our sensory organs are two dimensional sensory organs, but those are projections on a three dimensional space. So my vision is a projection on a three dimensional space, so is my, my figure. Um, but we don't, in general, we can't say anything about it. It's, I don't know if, if the column assumes there's a three-dimensional space and we have two-dimensional projections, or it could assume there's n-dimensional space and some n-dimensional projections on it. That, it may be hardwired for three-dimensional spaces. We don't know that. Uh, but, so I'm assuming that we don't know that. And so we have, then we can ask the question, how is this input, which is some just bunch of bits, uh, representing a cortex? And we have a hypothesis for that. Um, the hypothesis is built on a lot of data, and, um, and that's, I call it the spatial polar minicom hypothesis. Okay, so I'll, I'm going to go through that in a moment. But we have an idea like, okay, this input comes in, how are we going to represent it up here in a useful way? We've got a hypothesis for that. We have a bunch of models for that. If you think about the motor output, layer 5, now that's, that's basically these layer 5 cells um, that project to some someplace else in the brain that's motor related. So they never drive muscles directly. They're always, um, they're always projecting some other area that drives the muscles. And, and that's from the cortex. We, uh, we can say that it's going to be another sparse distributed representation because everything in the brain is a sparse distributed representation. Um, we can say that, uh, I've always said, and I still believe, that, that these cells don't know what they're projecting to. They don't know how to do this. They have to learn how to control the subcortical thing. So this is a generic learning system that says, okay, I, don't, I have to somehow figure out how to sociably link to these other cells someplace else that are making motor behavior so that I can control them. Um, so that has to be learned. This, this is not like, oh, this cell goes to this thing and this cell goes to that thing. It's like, no, I just a bunch of cells projected some other bunch of cells and somehow it has to learn to control them. Uh, so in general, every region of the cortex, as far as we know, these cells project to some subcortical motor area uh, that then does the actual behaviors. And one of the questions that I've always worried about or thought about is, and we don't really have an answer to this, is what is the form of this motor SDR? How do I think about that? I have a way of thinking about the input. I can say, oh, the input comes in, and I'm going to represent an X. And then I say to myself, well, I know these cells have to control something, but what's, how do I understand them? How do I make these fluid movements? It's, it's like, what do these bits mean? How, what do the L5 cells represent? It's very, it was never really clear to me. So that is like, what is the form of the motor SDR? What do the bits, these L5 cells mean? Can I put some kind of meaning on them? And then how do they socially link to the subcortical motor areas? And so this whole link here is kind of a, this representation and link was a much poorer formed idea, um, in my mind, than the input input. The input, I have a clearer sense of what's going on. The output is like, oh, what the hell is going on there? We know what's going on, but how do I think about that? 
So that was, I was thinking about this problem, um, and that's what this, uh, this little discussion is about. Now I want to go through the, the spatial pooler minicon hypothesis. Uh, this is not new. This is like, okay, we have this input. How are we representing it here? Um, and because I think that's a clue to the, how we get the output here. So far, so good? Everyone following? Okay. So this is, again, Yeah. I don't know what you, I mean, it depends what mathematically the definition of a, what's that? Huh? I was thinking if you think of SVM as the proper analogy. I mean, it's a, like a kernel in yeah. that sense, uh, but it's, it's not continuous in any way. Pure binary, it's not a binary hypercube. I'm not really sure what. Yeah, well, a plane, a, plane, a, plane, and a, a plane and a binary hypercube is like, it's like, it's like a point. Yeah, so this is like a, I'd say like a slice or a volume of... Okay, so I wrote slice first, but even the word slice sort of implies that there's a plane. Yeah, yeah. So I, you know, that's why... It's a subset. Uh, but I think this is actually a key point here, because you're going to see in a moment why I think this is important. Um, this is... It's easy to make, like, just think of a high-dimensional vector, like a normal vector. This, okay, suppose there are 2,000 input bits, 40... Uh, 40 um, Suppose this cell is connect, is connected to forty of the input bits. That's like it's pointing some direction in two thousand dimensional space, and it's like a normal vector of the plane. Uh, so yes, I don't know. Yeah, that makes any sense of the binary though. It's purely binary, and we're talking about one mini problem here. Is, is yeah. it important to think of the plane or what the plane separates? Uh, I'm not sure, Kevin. It, the, uh, the point thing I'm going to get to in a moment, um, and this is why I'm having this conversation, because it's a little bit confusing. The way I was trying to think about it is, um, if you can think about it as a plane, visualize it literally as like a plane. I mean, a plane in hyperspace isn't never looks like a plane in three, you know, a, three, a plane in three-dimensional space for the obvious. It's a two-dimensional sheet that transacts a three-dimensional space, right? And what is a plane, you know, what is a, a plane in a higher dimensional space or in a lower dimensional space? You know, what if it's binary? It's, well, so there, there's some set of inputs that'll make that mini column come back Yes, and but so I that, think, that, I'm trying to get, I, I, I'm, I'm working on it. You'll see in a moment, you know, I'm, gonna try, I'm trying to get to a visualization to imagine something else that's going on, and that visualization helps me to think about it as a plane. So, um, so let's just leave it at the moment. This is part of the point of today's conversation is to talk about this, exactly this, um, how to visualize this. But, but in a moment, you'll see where I'm coming from. It won't take me too long to get to the rest of this. So we, we leave this open as a question. Now. How do you think about this? What, what is the, what's the right metaphor to think about it? But, but you are assuming binary. I'm assuming binary, but I don't want to, you know, in the brain, it's, these things aren't really binary. If, you know, when we think about a visual cortex, um, and we say, oh, these mini columns are dividing up by orientation, right? Well, when one of these is active, it's, it's, not, it's not really binary. There's, there's a graded response. So this one would be most active, and this one would be a little bit less active, and this one would be a little bit less active. So it's not purely binary. We, we sort of abstracted it to binary, thinking, okay, can we understand it that way? Uh, in, in the real brain, it's not exactly binary. There's a bump and tails off. Um, so I'm trying to avoid that. Um, I'm trying. To, I'm trying. I'm hoping to say that the whole thing can be understood either way, whether you make it binary or slightly, you know, uh, non-binary. Doesn't shouldn't matter. It's a high-dimensional space. You're picking a set of um, bits that represent it. Uh, anyway, that's part of the confusion. Um, can I go on? So here's an observation about the cortex that uh, some of us know very well. Um, if you look at the cells in a mini column, so here's like pictures of mini columns here, right? And so we're saying each of these mini columns represents a different sort of set of bits or a different sort of feature in the input space. Um, and in the classic view where they started doing this in visual cortex, there's this idea of simple and complex cells. A simple cell, if you have the visual cortex, a simple cell says, oh, I represent this feature at this location. So there's a vertical line in some part of the visual space, 
And it's, it's very tightly con, um, tied to that point in visual space. But most of the cells in the mini there are some that look like this. This is like, that's, that's your plastic detected feature. These bits are on, boom, they're on together. Um, they, they, you know, these literally represent like, you know, sort of a bunch of bits that represent some space in the visual space. Um, but most of the cells in a mini column are complex. And what complex means is that they're not exactly located, meaning the cell, the, the cell would respond to <clears throat> that vertical line in a series of different positions. Um, and so you can't just say, oh, it's a bunch of bits aligned, uh, or a bunch of positive and negative um, fields is what they would typically look at center on. They, they typically look at a center on and, and, and center off sub fields. And you can create this kind of simple response by just lining up a bunch of these, literally the bits lining up in the visual space. But then most of these cells in a mini column are complex, meaning that that's not true. They, the, the cortex learns to represent these at, that the cell becomes active at different positions. So there's a spatial invariance that, um, so this is a simple cell, and then this is a complex cell. And so there's a lot of hypotheses about how um, these cell sponsors are uh, learned because they don't seem to be in, it's not being passed in from the input space. It seems to be determined mostly, that most people believe it's determined within the column or within the cortex that it learns to represent cells that represent these different, um, to respond over this sort of spatial invariance. So can you explain the difference between simple and complex again? This is like for a cell, right? Like one particular cell. If you look at a cell and you, you, they stick a probe in the cortex and they say, oh, what makes this cell active? Yeah. Um, a simple cell, it, and, and so the inputs, and the inputs to the typically are like um, uh, a, coming from the retina, there would be a, a, uh, these cells here mm -hmm. uh, might respond to like, if there's a point that's on surrounded by negative, then that makes that cell active. And so what you can do is to get one of these, what it looks like when you find a simple cell in the cortex, which is often they see them in like layer four, it looks like they have a bunch of these lined up, literally so that, oh, when, when there's a, the, 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 the simple cell will say, when there's a bunch of these guys lined up like this, that represents, uh, then I become active. Um, so that's like a feature. Um, but if, notice here, if I, if I move the input over a little bit, uh, a simple cell stops working, stops responding. It has to be right in this position. Um, and, um, but complex cells respond uh, independent of position. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, it's, so like, think it's very analogous to the simple cell being a, fe a, a feature in a CNN. At a specific location. At a specific, which is a feature. So right. just like Again, a the complex cell would be the max pooled output. Okay. Right. The max pooled output would fire independent of you know, plus so or minus one or two. There's some orientation, but less specific about where it actually is. Okay. Okay. In, the, in the cortex, you see this development. You see simple cells closer to where the input comes in. And then you see elsewhere in, in here mostly complex cells. So it's as if it's as if this is what the, the cortex detects this feature, and then internally it learns to represent uh, the other cells in that mini column will say, yeah, I, I like that vertical line too, but I'm independent of exactly where it occurs. Do, do, we, do they have any biological difference, or they all look like they're all parameters? Uh, well, it's binary cell layers parameters, so, so you can say they're all the same. I mean, they're in different layers and different. Obviously, they are. They're not the same cells, right? But the way you differentiate them is by running experiments. Yes. But visually you can't tell. No, visually you can't tell. They just observe this. Um, and that's, this is observation, this experimental observation. So um, there's, some, there's a few simple cells, but most of the cells, if you go across, if, again, in a, in a mini column, you basically get all the cells in the mini column are going to be basically based on the same feature. But then most of the cells in the minicom, a few will be simple, but most of them will have this sort of complex thing. And by the way, this, this has been analyzed out the wazoo. I mean, there's very fine differentiations about this. I'm not going to talk about end stopping and various widths and so on. Um, they, empirically, they've sort of differentiated how the cells in different layers are slightly different in this complex cell. 
Now, there's another complexity that most of the complex cells are motion sensitive, almost all of them. And what does that mean? Well, yes, they're, they're, they, they, are, they will respond in different positions, but if, if, if the line is moving one way or another way, they quickly differentiate. So some cells seem to prefer, oh, if they go this way, I become really active, but I don't respond at all if they go that way. And this, another cell just said, oh, the line's moving that way. I respond very strongly, but I don't respond at all going this way. So the majority of the cells in a, in a cortical column, a mini column, uh, all have the same sort of simple representation, but then they differentiate by movement over, over through space. Um, and so again, this has um, been studied a lot empirically. Yeah. Now, our, my thought about this always has been like, oh, well, these movements here, uh, why, would the, why would the cortex, why would most of these cells be directional sensitive? Directional sensitive. Um, and you might say, oh, well, because I'm observing a bird fly by and I need to represent you know, the movement going one way or the other way. Um, uh, something like that, but uh, I'm going to make an alternate hypothesis today about why they look like this, um, and and maybe maybe I'm ready for that. Uh, I don't know. Let me see here. Um, so that was, that led to some um, that led to this question. I said, okay, most of the cells in minicom are complex, position invariant. Most of the complex cells are motion sensitive. Why are they motion sensitive? Why would that be a dominant representation in throughout? The different layers here, um, and again, it could have been just like, oh, I need to represent movement in the world. Um, but there's another possibility. Uh, the other possibility is, remember, there's two reasons that things change. One is because the world is moving, and one is because you physically are moving. And what if, what if the directional sensitivity of these cells was reflecting more? The movement of the sensor, or the movement of the, the thing that's sending my inputs, you can think of it as a sensor, if you will, like a finger tap or something like that. If I move my finger one way or the other, then these, then I would, I would see, I would see these, uh, these, uh, these changes like this. And so uh, these changes could be representing this, 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 these um, directional sensitivity could be representing essentially movement of the thing, and again, it's easy to think about a finger um, or an eye moving, but it's basically saying uh, 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 this pattern is changing because the thing below me is moving. It's, 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 it's sensor in the world, it's moving in space. Um, and so it's my finger is moving over this thing like this. And, and I would want to differentiate between moving one way or the other way. Now, in the visual cortex, it, the, the predominant uh, breaking up of these mini columns is by orientation, and the movement is left, and its movement is basically per movement perpendicular to that um, orientation. Um, so obviously, if I have a, a mini column that's representing a vertical line, and the movement of the eye is such that I'm moving this way relative to the vertical line, well, the input's not going to change, really. Um, but if I move my eye this way, then that thing's going to move across. So you can think of this as sort of um, uh, these changes are movements perpendicular to the slice of the mini column. So I got a feature, and now once I have that feature, um, I'm invariant to position. You know, anything along in that plane is going to stay the same. But as I move across, I'm now moving in perpendicular to that slice of the input space. So. Um, um, so I'm, this is what I'm saying right here. This is this half-baked idea I have. Each mini column is a plane, or we can call it a slice, or some unknown name for that, of the input space. Uh, it, it's easy to think of it as a plane if we're not limiting ourselves to binary inputs. The complex spells are responding um, to perpendicular shifts of that plane, so they mean the cell would respond anywhere in this, as I move that plane. And, and I'm asking, what if the motion-sensitive cells mostly represent changes caused by motor movements? Um, if that were true, now I have a, a layer 5 cell, which is uh, in the same mini column, let's say. And let's say that layer 5 cell is motion-sensitive, which they generally are. Um, then um, that bit could say, oh, um, I'm going to respond when whatever is 
whatever is uh, whatever my mini column is detected is currently a feature or, or my slice when that slice through space is moving perpendicular one way or the other. Um, any, and, and we can think of it here, as there's only two directions, but I'm not sure it should be limited. It could be other dimensions too. I don't really know what that means. But all I can say is that the layer five cell is representing a movement that's not in the plane, but perpendicular to the plane. Um, and I can differentiate movements in different, different directions. Um, and and if, if think about here, if, if, the, if the thing down below, this system down here that's actually doing the movement, um, I don't know what it's doing, right? It's my, my finger down here. This column doesn't really know it's a finger. It doesn't really know what it's doing. He says, oh, the input's changed. I, I detect some feature, and now the feature is moving perpendicular to that feature. Uh, the, the, the system is somehow moving perpendicular to that feature. Um, I could represent, I have a cell that represents that perpendicular movement. It says, I'm, uh, this, is, this cell represents movement perpendicular to that feature, and I can now associate this, I'm not talking about individual cells at the moment now, but this cell can be associated with that movement. Um, it says, yeah, I know what you're doing. You're moving, moving perpendicular to this. I should have I drawn this here, because it's in this mini column. Um, this, this mini column represents a slice. The slice is moving. It's moving because you're moving, and now I can represent that movement with a bit, saying that's his movement going this way or that way, um, uh, one going this way, one going that way, depending on how you're moving, and I have a bit now that represents, I can give a meaning to it. The same way I can give a meaning to the input bits is like, oh, this is a, a slice of the input space. Here I can say this, it, this bit, this motor bit, represents that slice moving perpendicular to that input space, left or right, um, and I know you're doing that because the input's changing in a certain way, and um, and if I if I detect that movement, then I can output my thing saying, okay, uh, you can I can now I'm now a bit one bit in the SDR motor SDR is representing that particular plane moving perpendicular. If if it turns out that the movement um, was slower, like, let's say the movement actual movement was not perpendicular but some. A, angle to this particular feature, um, then this activity that cell would be lower. If the movement was uh, in plane with that, I wouldn't have any output. So the layer five cells are going to be a subset of all the mini columns that are active. Uh, it's, they're going to be the ones that are moving in perpendicular at the rate at which they're moving perpendicular to their interfaces. That is a definition of a motor SDR. Um, and that motor SDR can say, OK, if I look at all the bits, and I can say, OK, of all the possible motor outputs, only some are active. And they are, those individual bits now represent um, the degree in which I'm moving perpendicular to the particular mini columns um, slice of space. Um, that sort of gives me a way of thinking about um, uh, what this layer 5 SDR represents. It's a, it's a set of. Um, just like the input space can be divided up into the set of slices that represent the input, common input, the layer five now can represent um, the set of um, movements of those slices, um, and and so it would be a subset of that. But it gives me a sort of a, a, a meaning for each bit, just like I can have a meaning for each bit in the input space. So that was it. What if motor sensitive cells mostly represent changes caused by motor movement? Then a single mini column represents a plane in the input space called with debate that most of the sensitive cells in that mini column represent perpendicular movements of that plane. Um, and that feels the beginning of an idea about how to think about motor outputs. It's like, OK, now I have, I, I can associate cells in layer 5 with the behavior down here. So now I have an SDR in layer 5 where I can associate with whatever is going on in this, this input. Um, it makes sense, to, it, it gives me a way of constructing this SDR that makes sense to relate to how the thing is moving. Um, where before I, it was a long hand waving, it just said, well, the layer 5 cells represent something. Uh, it's not clear what they represent. The guys clarification? Yeah, there, probably I won't be able to clarify because it's very confusing. But well, I think ahead. it's a small thing. So the motor output, is that an output as in a motor command or is it an output as a representation of like uh, the what motor? Uh, uh, like what's actually happening as far as like movement? This would be, um, it's both, uh, in the sense that during the learning phase, this thing is moving, 
this thing is representing that movement. Uh, and and now I can learn to associate this thing is that I'm moving, I'm 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 performing motion 24, and this guy can say I have a representation of that motion 24. It's an SDR that I can associate your SDR that's motion 24 with my SDR that represents 24. So that in that case, in the learning phase, layer five is representing the motion that this guy is doing. But in the future, I want layer five to tell this guy what to do. Does this be predicting though, or is that is it predicting in a different? Uh, it's not predicting, it's telling them what to do. That after I've learned this, I need to, the whole point of this is that like, the cortex now wants to drive the subcortical stuff. It wants to say like, okay, I've learned how you, how you work, work. I'm now going to tell you what to do. I'm going to tell you, you should be doing this in motion 24, followed by motion 26, followed by motion 932. So it's like, I need to, this is why I go back to here. I said the motor output must be associatively linked between layer five cells and the subcortical motor areas. Because at birth, it doesn't know what to do. So we need a, a process where we observe what's going on in the world. I somehow form a representation that's meaningful of that. And now I can link that representation to what this guy was doing. And, and now I have the ability to make this guy do something he wasn't going to do. So basically, it's assuming the world is static, that you're causing these movements. And by figuring out the inputs, assuming you're causing these movements, it knows how things are changing. And now if it wants that change to happen, it can say, okay, now do the same yes. thing that you were yes. doing before, yes. assuming the world is happening. Yeah. Yeah. You can think of it this way. Imagine this agent, this thing down here, this agent down here, is moving around the world and exploring and just doing stuff. And this guy's observing it, saying, oh, okay, I'm observing what you're doing. You're And now, after I observe what you're doing, I've built up a model of what you've just done. I've seen. Uh, I've seen how you move, and I've seen how the world looks, and I've built a model here. And uh, now that I have that model, by the way, um, and you want to get back to point A in the world, um, I can tell you how to do that. I'm just going to generate a series of behaviors that are novel that you've never actually sequence you've never seen before. I'm going to create a novel sequence of behaviors you've already exhibited, um, but I'm going to do to some higher level goal where the, the lower agent may have just been wandering around the world, sort of you know finding food or whatever. And, um, random explorations, and now I have a model of the world. Now, given that model of the world, I can tell you, don't be random anymore. I'm going to direct you how to get someplace and what state to get into. That's the way to think about the cortex as a whole. The cortex builds this model of the world, and the whole point is it's a sophisticated model that the old brain does not have, and, uh, and allows the cortex to direct the behaviors of the old brain to, to achieve certain goals um, that the cortex alone has. Um, and that's it, by, because the cortex is generic, that it's not, that it, it, we, if we go on non causal assumption, which is mostly almost completely true, that these are generic systems and they can't, everything has to be learned. I have to learn what the world looks like, I have to learn how to control the world. Um, I need some way of a method for figuring out how to represent behaviors that control this guy, and I can do it again in novel ways. I don't know if that's making it any easier or not. I didn't talk about the thalamus at all. No, I, I understand. I'm just going one more because you're, you're, you're involved with motor function. Yeah. Okay. So how are you able to abstract away the cerebellar cortex as not being a vital participant in this? So uh, my simple answer to that is you can be a completely normal being without a, without a cerebellum. You can have a cerebellum removed and be normal. That's happened to people? Yeah, I know someone. I have a personal friend who has no cerebral. You know a guy? A woman. <laughs> um, and what, and she has deficits. But her deficits are, uh, are a lot of, she says, I can't multitask. When she wants to do something, she has to think about every single thing she does. Okay. So it, the, when you think about it that way, the cerebellum is involved in these fine motor control systems, the very fine motor control. Uh, they smooth things out, they do small movements, they blink the eyes of the rabbit, they do all kinds of uh, motor behaviors, that, but they're small and not very, um, they don't represent a model of the world. They're sort of like, um, uh, 
uh, intermediate function, if you will. And without it, the cortex has a harder time controlling things because it has to be more direct. It has to go down lower. So instead of just saying, here's a general command like, move your finger quickly in this direction, it has to say, oh, don't think about anything else. You know, you know move your finger over here, <laughs> type of thing. So she has to think about everything. So things like, as referred to as muscle memory, where you learn trained, complex motions that might reside in the... Uh, yeah, the that's one way to look at it. Cerebral seems to do a lot of stuff, but it's all very simple. The circuitry there is simple. You can understand how it operates. There's been multiple now uh, proven theories about exactly what those cells are doing. It's not very sophisticated. That's a lot of it, but it's not very sophisticated. So it's, you can think of it like a smoothing function or a, um, it's a, you know, intermediate, low-level behaviors, but nothing really interesting. <laughs> nothing, nothing we can call intelligent. It's just like, yeah, okay, it makes it easier to move your arm in a smooth motion to grab the cup without it, you have to think about moving your hand to get the cup. Interesting. Yeah. But a long time ago, I eliminated the cerebellum because uh, it's a big structure, not really as big as the neocortex, but it's got more neurons than the, than the neocortex. It's got more neurons than anything else in the brain. But the neurons are, it's a very simple uh, um, circuitry. I say simple, it's far more simple than we have in the neocortex. There's basically the three cell types and then their connectivity is well known and you can deduce their function. So, um, but I, it, it's not just this woman I know, but it, it, this was, uh, it was observed over other things too that you can have severe damage to your, your cerebellum and live a normal life. You're not like you're cognitively impaired. Just out of curiosity for, for this uh, woman, when she was injured, did it take a period of time for her to be able to adapt to the loss? Or yeah, uh, I think so. I actually didn't know her at the time. She had a tumor and they had to remove the cerebellum. Um, it's a teeny bit left, but I think most of it's gone. And um, uh, but it's generally known to be a safe area to remove. I, I don't think, unlike cortex, you remove some part of the cortex, you lose vision or you lose language or whatever. Uh, I don't believe there's any part of the cerebellum where you say, hey, if you remove that, you turn into a vegetable. It's more like, um, and I don't know if she had a period of adaption. I probably did. Almost everything requires some period of adaption. Yeah, I, met her, I met her after she had the surgery, and she had it probably in her 20s, and she's now in her 60s. Um, and if you meet her, you, you, if you didn't, I didn't know her beforehand. She's a little bit sort of halting in her speech. You know, a little bit sort of a slow talker type of person. Um, but I don't think you would have said, oh, there's something wrong with her. Um, I think you would just say, that's a personality. But her husband, and she will say, oh, no, I was different before. She was like a McKinsey consultant and hard driver, fast person. Now she's kind of a slower, um, more relaxed. <laughs> so interesting, uh, but you wouldn't look. At, you wouldn't look and tell something wrong. With it. Not absolutely not. Yeah. Can I ask about the bolus topic. The what? The bolus topic. Yeah, yeah, I haven't gotten there yet. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, if you want to ask that, you. No. I, you just wanted to know what it is. I just like you. Well, the interesting question here is. Uh, I said the bonus topic. Do columns need an effort to copy motor command? So I put it in green here, and a super type pointed out, we, yeah, it's, there's a lot of confusion about it. Um, where is it? Where is it coming from? For example, uh, let me give you some of the background for this. Um, in the motor, in the visual system, the, the subcortical area that, that, uh, that the visual cortex projects to is called the superior delivery. And this is the old brain's uh, this is the old, uh, the old brain's visual system. So, and this moves the eye. So when the cortex projects to the superior colic, this is a basic idea. It's telling the eyes which way to move, how much to move, and so on. But the, the superior colic is, you know, it's an old brain structure, and it does its own thing anyway. It, it, you know, something moves over here, moves her eyes, and you know, so it's 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 basically the cortex is trying to control them. Now. I said to myself, well, then there are a lot of these signals from the superior colliculus going back to the cortex, basically saying, oh, here's my efferent's copy. And there are, there are signals from here that go through the thalamus um, and supposedly project to the cortex, but very little is known about them. We, we, uh, there, this is, I think, the conus cellular layer, I think it was. And so there is a signal that does this. 
But it wasn't clear exactly where it projects here or what its influence is. It just hasn't really been studied. So there's an indication that there is an interference copy coming from this thing going to here through the thalamus, the different, part, different layers in the thalamus. So, hey, that's good evidence of the interference copy. Um, but in other cases, it's not clear where it's coming from. Um, and if it's always there, it's just, it's just like you can't find literature on this. It's just kind of, mis it's just not a lot. And, it's, and we've speculated, as soon as I point out, that if you have a, uh, a what column and a where column, well, the where column is going to be moving your body. And therefore, we said, we said well, there's a projection between layer six here and layer six here. And maybe that's converging from a movement in body space to a movement in, um, in uh, object space. Uh, but even that, it, this evidence of that is kind of uh, weak. Um, so I just asked the question, what occurred to me and what this bonus topic is, I suddenly said, well, do I actually have to have this efforts copy? Notice that once this guy learns a model of the world, it doesn't need an efforts copy to make predictions of its own movements. It can predict, it's, once it's learned a model, it can predict the input based on its own movements. I'm going to move over here, and this is what I'm supposed to see. Um, I also, the subcortical areas are also doing a lot of motions. So yes. if you didn't have that, you would be very confused. Well, that's an interesting question. So, you know, like walking is an example. Like, I don't think the neocortex is controlling every step. It's not. The neocortex is not controlling every step. Um, I'm going to, the exact right question, but let me, let me explore the alternate hypothesis. The alternate hypothesis of, let's say, walking is that as you're walking, the lower parts of the brain are actually predicting each step. They also have a motor model of the world. They predict what each step is going to be. Maybe it's the cerebellum. It predicts each sound. I mean, and and that, that this guy doesn't need to make that low-level prediction. It just says, you walk, and I predict you're going to get someplace. Um, and so if, if in, under that scenario, if there was an unusual sound from your walking, or you sort of tripped up on something, this guy wouldn't notice it. Um, right away. And this guy would notice it and say, hey, that's wrong. Um, and, and so, similar with like in vision, um, if, I'm, if I'm looking, if the cortex is directing my eyes to move around some object and say, okay, I'm looking, I expect to see this over there, and this over there, this over there, this over there. And then the door opens to the side of the room. Everyone has turns to the door. Everyone. And that is not happening up here, that's happening down here. Then the question is, okay, so the pericolicus noticed something was changing, it moved the eye movement over here. The court in this scenario, if I wasn't getting that reference copy, then this guy wouldn't be able to predict what you're going to see. And the question is, do I predict what I'm going to see? That's an interesting question. When the door opens on the side of the room, we all turn our head, um, what's my mental experience? Is my mental experience, oh, I'm expecting to see the door there, or is my mental experience like, oh, something happened, oh, now I'm looking at this. Um, it's not clear to me that 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 you absolutely that the cortex is going to predict all these movements. Um, uh, and, and all I'm pointing out here is I can, this whole system can be learned, and I can learn a predictive model of the world through the mechanisms I just talked about, without actually knowing this reference copy. In some, in some sense, I'm, I'm I'm substituting this hypothesis of motion sensitive cells. For the, for the, instead of the inference copy. If I had an Efricons and motor command, I have to figure out how to translate that into something meaningful up here. But in this case, I'm saying I can determine on my own how to represent motions, behaviors, just by looking at how these inputs change. And now I have a representation that tells me how to represent behavior. Um, I could, on top of that, I could try to associate some efforts copy with that. Uh, I could, but I'm not using this to train the system. I'm, I'm, I, it's like up to now, I would say, oh, I need to get this reference copy to be able to train my motor, my, my model of the world. And I'm saying I, it's possible I might be able to learn this model of the world without an reference copy. It's optional. And if I have it, then I could potentially learn to associate this reference copy with my model. Say, oh, yeah, okay, I've decided to represent movement to the left by this SDR of layer five cells. And you are sending me up a signal that says, um, that's what you're doing, fine. I can associate your signal with my signal. But I'm not using this to learn the model. Uh, I'm using this. That, it, it, it's interesting that 
with this idea that these motion direction cells are a way of independently learning how to represent behaviors with not knowing the efferent copy motor command, just by observation of the many columns and how they move, um, their, their inputs and how they move. So that, that to me was like an eye opener. It's like, hey, I don't need this to learn the model of the world. Um, I might have it, I may not have it. I'm not, sh I'm not saying we don't have it. I'm not saying it's, well, I guess maybe what I am saying is, here's a hypothesis how we can learn a model of the world without it. How, how do I incorporate it? It would be different. And, and now I have at least a way of thinking about layer five cells to say, yeah, they're a subset of many columns. They represent what that slice is doing, which way it's moving. And that's a good representation of, um, of motor behavior. Um, you know, movements orthogonal to whatever features I'm detecting. Uh, I don't know how to say it better than that. Uh, it's, it's kind of a bit fuzzy in my world's mind. So uh, I didn't say we don't have efferent copy. I'm not saying it's not useful. Maybe I, all I'm saying is that a quarter of a column could learn a model of the world without it. Um, it won't be able to predict the future inputs if the, if, if the behaviors are generated so cortically. But um, in, even more, than that, I think more generally, you know, we have thousands of cortical columns. They're yeah. all trying to direct movement. Yeah. And from a given cortical column's perspective, it just has a little bit of influence. And so to do prediction, it really needs to know what actually happened and it's not just subcortical motor structures, it's also all of the other cortical columns that are controlling things. Yeah. You know, so this is V4 cortical column, there's V1, V2, you know, and all sorts of things that are trying to control your. Yeah, your yeah, so yeah. Well, so. Th so that it's like a distributed sense, and I'm giving a little bit of suggestion, yeah. and then now I need to know what actually happened to. Well, maybe. Uh, I, yeah, so I purposely didn't want to talk about multiple columns here, because if you think about multiple columns in a hierarchy, V1, V2, V4, I might come up with something. If I think about um, multiple columns as not hierarchical, but parallel at different, you know, in the thousand branch hypothesis, they're parallel at some point, um, and representing different slices, the big size of the input space, uh, I might come up with a different thing. And there's this huge, we still don't understand how layer five cells, how do they become the input to the next column? Um, I'm saying that from a particular cortical columns perspective, if it's 100% responsible for the movements, then you don't need the reference copy probably. But if it's only partially responsible, in order to do prediction, you need to know what actually happens. Well, uh, so let's, let's be careful. Um, so you're right. So a single, this is one of the mysteries of movement. So like a single column might be representing the tip of my finger. And it could represent the motion of that finger in, in its space. But then when I actually do something, it's this whole complex armature yeah. that changes. Um, I was avoiding that question at the moment. Um, I, I'm trying to tackle one piece of this problem, just one piece, um, as a way of maybe performing a new basis for figuring out the bigger problem. Like if, I, if, if this hypothesis was right, and I'm far from saying it's right, but it's, what's really suggested to me is how common complex motion sensitive cells are. That, that is like the, throughout the cortical column. And why would it be that way? Well, it could be they are representing behaviors. That could be the representation of movement. And the whole system is sensory motor. So I have sensory, and now I'm, I have a SDR where it represents that sensory input under this motor position, motor command. That hypothesis gives me a new way of thinking about layer five, a new way of thinking about various things. And now maybe we can come back later and adjust, well, why do layer five cells project to the thalamus? Or why do they connect in this way? Or how do I represent the broader motor thing? Um, I don't, I don't have any answers to those yet. It's just like, this is an interesting idea on its own that maybe provides a basis for um, how to go forward. Reminds me of this Held and Hind experiment. You remember like the two cats? Oh, was this the one that was moving and the one that was just yeah. the, it being the carriage? Yeah. Was, uh, yeah. It's, what, what is that? Uh, so there's two cats. They're in identical environments. Um, but they're t linked together. Only one person's move, only one of the cat's movements moved the environment. So the other cat, their, their legs were not allowed to move. Okay. And whenever this cat moved, both environments would rotate the same way. Literally, they had the cats on two arms of a, of a, a, a bar. Yeah. And the cat, one cat could walk around, 
and turned his body. And whatever that kid did, got the other hat saw the same thing. Yeah, they designed it so they, the visual input was identical okay. to both cats, but only one cat was responsible for the movement. Right. And then they, they so that they brought out these two cats this way. And then they did a bunch of tests afterwards. Like one, in both cases, you saw the same thing, but are you able to do similar tasks? And right. the, the cat that was restrained in movement was very limited in what it could do. And, and things like, um, th there were a lot of deficits that it had. Okay. Um, so it again suggests that you need to somehow be able to control your movements in order to really learn us. Well, wait, that is not a surprise anymore for us, right? How could you possibly learn a model of the world? Um, this would not be predicted by a pure feed core. No, but, but our, whole, the same thing about our whole, the whole theory of the thousand brains theory and the column theory says the world is a complex structure and you cannot observe it all at once. And therefore, to learn a model of the world, you have to move through the world. And if all you're doing is feed forward stuff, you're not really learning a model of the world, you're learning image classification or pattern classification. But to learn the structure of the world and how to move through the world, you have to move. It's, just, it's, a, it's, like, it's like I can't learn a model of Redwood City if, by sitting in this room. It's impossible. <laughs> you know, I have to walk around the city. Um, so the same thing with the cat. If all I see these things flying past me, how am I going to know what's going on? It's like I, I can't associate my behaviors with, you know, I can't map out my input on some metric space. Um, so we need to have that. It's just, it's. For, I just, I felt there's something what really attracted. I'm gonna say it again. What's really attractive to me about this is the idea that there's these. It, it, it gives me a way of thinking about representing motor behavior, which I did not have before, and it and it explains why there are most of these cells are motion sensitive, which always was a little bit bizarre, um, 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 and it's basically sort of integrating. If we think about those motion sensitive cells, not as like the world is moving on its own most of the time, but it's mostly moving because I'm moving, then those are sensory motor representations. Um, and, that, and, that it, and then it's intriguing to think like, why would I want to represent motion as orthogonal movements to the primary slices I've decided? It's like, it's like it somehow feels right, but I can't put my finger on why it feels right. Uh, it just feels like that's a good way of representing motion. It's like you've already decided, you know, how to divide up the space into a set of bits, and now it's in those features, and those are the features you're observing right now, um, and that's the top rank features, and now we're seeing how those top rank features are moving, that seems to make sense. Um, and now we have a representation for that. So the SDR of layer five cells is, like we, on our temporal memory hypothesis, the temporal memory is essentially, the SDR is the, the state of the sequence uh, at that point in time, and the layer five cells are the same thing. It's, it's basically um, the state of this feature in movement in time. It's, it's, just a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a subset of the, the feature representing movement, where the other one's a subset of the feature. It's a, it, it, the feature in context here is the feature in motion context. How about that way? It's the feature in motion context, um, where our temporal memory is the feature in pure time-based context. So it's, again, a subset of cells that become active in the mini column, representing this particular behavior at this moment in time. Um, so that's that's it. It's just, I have nothing else to say. <laughs> it's just, I'm trying to make sense of this. Can I draw one interpretation of Please do. This, this picture of moving orthogonal to a plane? I Please. just want to know. Please do. There's one easy way to draw it, and I, I'm 50 50 on whether this is what you mean. Um, so, like, um, First, just to pick, like we're talking about, like a single mini column, and you need, like some set of input bits. Um, so, and let's say this particular mini column, um, say its its feature, just to keep this simple, is going to be these two bits. Uh, it it likes when these two bits are active. Uh, so, yeah, there are two bits there. Um, so, say this mini column has this learn feature. Um, so, so the sub this subset of the input space can be drawn as like a pair of axes where this is like bit one, uh, this is bit two, uh, and right now this um, mini column's plane and in the input space is this, uh, and well, how do we get to that? Uh, uh, so because um, because right now there are four possible responses for these two bits. So it could be this. This, uh, this, or this. Yeah. Uh, and when we talk about a plane in terms of uh, you know neural networks and SVMs and everything, you're talking about like um, this. Uh, 
this plane depicts this column's um, um, receptive field yeah. it, because uh, like its response uh, it responds it, it likes things that are far away from this plane. Uh, so right now this right now this cells. Oh, uh, that's the way you think about it in the um, in like a classifier, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, or I think of it as those cells are defining a plane. So both bit one and bit two are on, then uh, the plane goes through that upper right point because I know this is different. I was confused by this. I was talking to super type about this a week ago. Um, it's just my, my visualization struggles with this, uh, this idea. You're saying you want to be far away from that plane. Yeah, so it sounds like you're talking about um, a vector and you want to be, um, you, you want to be far along this vector. Um, like yeah, if that's what you think about as a vector. If, if you're projecting it onto it, a yeah. vector, that, that's, that's. Yeah, that's okay, all right, direction. fine. So, yeah, so, uh, so that vector is perpendicular to the plane. Yeah, yeah, it's normal. Yeah, so it's like the normal vector of, yeah. of this plane. So, I don't know, in this picture, this, uh, this view of. Um, in this picture, the idea of moving orthogonal to the plane is if the input is moving in this direction. If, if the if the input is moving where the bits that are on are turning off or yes the yeah so with one way to think about it, it, it um, if you were not orthogonal if you were if you're coplanar then changes would not affect those two bits so other bits can be changing but those two bits are staying on mm -hmm. so you say i'm still active and these other things i'm ignoring so um, uh, but if they both if they're changing that means I'm no longer in the, in the same plane. I'm someplace else, right? And if they, if they both change, then I must be moving orthogonal to the plane, right? If, if all my bits are changing simultaneously, then, um, then that, by definition, is an orthogonal movement, right? It's uh, to the whole thing. If uh, all the bits oh, I'm are, sorry, I'm sorry. All, all the bits, maybe if all the bits that this column is paying attention to. Yes, are, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm looking at 50 bits or 20 bits and say, I respond to this thing. Now, if the world changes and the other bits are changing and I'm still seeing this and I'm still active, then I would say that there's been no orthogonal movement. But if all of a sudden, all my, if half my bits change, well then it's not completely orthogonal, but if all my bits change, then it's orthogonal movement. Mm -hmm. Is that the same? I think I get difficulty when I think about the plane and where it is. And uh, but if we could talk about bits changing, then I would say well, if, if my input bits that I'm responding to all change at once, then the movement was orthogonal to my, my representation. So it sounds like you're talking when the, when the bits are moving along this line, along this dotted line, when the input, if, if the current activity is always like this green dot, and this green dot is like moving around, uh, as, as your input is yeah. changing, this green dot is moving around. Yeah. When the green dot moves along this black dotted line, that's the that's orthogonal to the. Uh, the problem with that again, if we're talking binary, that doesn't really make any sense. No, you're, you're right. Um, I think I think I, I have trouble with that. Um, uh, I'm not sure. I'm not seeing the right or wrong. Or it's just hard for me to think about it that way. But part of my question with here was, are you thinking of these bit spaces? Or when you're talking about planes and input spaces, are you thinking of this types of input space, or are you thinking of like physical space, like planes and three D world? Uh, well, it, it's tempting to use the physical space as a visual analogy. As right? an analogy, yeah, but are but you literally you, referring to like planes, like direction select, orientation selectivity? It's just planes and three D. I'm not sure. Space. I'm not I sure. Don't know Maybe I shouldn't use the word plane. I mean, that's my tendency is to think about physical planes that are slicing some three dimension. You can think of a plane as a is a, a lower dimensional projection in a higher dimensional space. So some dimensions, if you change in some dimensions, it doesn't, you're, you're the pl it, it might, my point, the plane, when I was thinking about this, and maybe I'm using it incorrectly, I was thinking about this mini column represents a plane. What I mean by that is um, the same mini column responds exactly the same um, where some of the bits that it's not paying attention can change, it doesn't affect it. But if the bits that are, and so that's like, those are, those are movements orthogonal to the plane, and, or orthogonal to the representation. Any, any changes in these bits here um, don't change this mini column, per se, as long as this mini column stays active. 
And, um, and then you say, okay, well, those are orthogonal movements. Um, um, but, uh, but, yeah. but it, 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 here's another thing to think about it. It's not just any change here. Remember, the complex cells are saying, where does the complex cell idea come along? The complex cell idea says, these are patterns that you typically observe in time. It's like a, it's like a temporal pooling operation. It says, this is equal to this, is equal to this, is equal to this, is equal to this, only because I've observed them in time. That's the assumption. I observed this pattern followed by this pattern followed by this pattern, this pattern. But either way, that's how I represent a complex cell. It's not, it's not some inherent property of the space. And now, given I've, I've done some temporal pooling that says these were equivalent, now I can further subdivide and say, well, there's movements in this way, and there's movements in this way, there's so, I'm subdivided so there. So I, I, I guess I'm, I'm having really trouble on using the word plane. That's why I kind of, I said slice, plane quotes. I don't know, Marcus, it's confusing to me. So I, and you guys think about planes differently. You think it in the, in the SVM or the... Can I ask a question about the, the complex cells? If I remember correctly, uh, the grouping of the orientations is usually still somewhat localized. It's not a single feature, but it's still localized in the visual field. Uh, I mean, the human wings the thing when they, they generalize, they talk about hypercomplex, where it says, yeah, I see that orientation anywhere in the visual field. That was an abstraction. But don't those, don't those? Well, it's over a small area. But it's over a small area. Yeah, so, not anywhere in the visual field. It's over a small area. Right, right. Yeah. right. But you could imagine if you were pooling the outputs of that to a higher level, then you can say there's some motion anywhere in the visual field. Well, all you can say that you wouldn't. All you can say is those those things are equivalent. Which that's a complex cell, right? A complex cell says, I respond independent of where this feature is. It's the same feature, but it's, it's anywhere in this range. Right, but you, you still have some notion of locality. But if you wanted to, uh, not uh, if you just if you did the temple pooling over that, then you lost. You'd have a, a broader sense of locality, right? You'd be right, less specific. Right. Right. Yeah. So you have some notion. There is some motion in this particular area of the visual field. It doesn't tell me there's motion. It de the complex cell just says this feature exists anywhere in this visual field. Only when I get to the, t the, the motion sensitive complex cells can I say there's motion. At that point, I could, one moment I give you the vertical line on the left, and then an hour later I give you the vertical line on the right, and the same cell is going to respond. I see. So it doesn't, there's no implied motion at that point. There's applied equivalence. Okay. Right. That's I, I, super. I saying that's like your I guess like your max pooling operation, right? There's no motion in the max pooling operation. It's just a temporal pooling operation. It's just simple temporal pooling operation. Says these are equivalent. Right. But it also means that you, if you wish, detect motion aside. You detect that feature so with some spatial invariance. In other words, I see this feature. Yeah. I don't have to be right precise on this thing. Yeah. I can be a little bit over. So that gives you. You wish a, a, a soft yeah. yeah, that's your max pooling. I guess. Right. So if you imagine where you're looking at these things, where these um, uh, court columns uh, exist, such that you have the orientation slightly tilted on the kind of adjacent ones, you yeah. have this thing that you can go The orientation progresses as you move around. Right. So that gives you a softness in orientation, too, if you pool from there, too, right? Yeah, but I don't know if there's any evidence for that. Um, you would if you pull from that. If you pull from that, then you're back to where you started from. Then basically everything gets pulled together. Well, I'm saying you know not everything. I'm just saying if you have selective pooling, then you basically if you're saying yeah, the example you gave up there where you had you know it's perfectly vertical, but the other orientations kind of get this little bit of excitation. Yeah, yeah. So you get a little softness there, which you is do. actually good. It's noise yeah. immunity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's noise immunity. Yeah. yeah, but you don't pull over all of them because then you no, walk no, no, that no, 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 no. no. no yeah. I didn't mean that. You, you, so, you still need to be. So what it's basically it. what it, another way of interpreting it as opposed to noise meter, you could say um, these features aren't binary. Right. There are there is a small level of uh, gradation or scale to them. Softness. To them, yeah. Well, softness, but I I would rather call it scale. It's like uh, how how vertical is this? Well, it's really vertical or mostly vertical, and then not enough to be count. You know, so. Maybe think of that as a two bits of precision or something like that, okay. right? That's what it appears to be in the cortex. We abstracted that to purely binary just because it's easier, and and it seemed to work pretty well. So we didn't go back yet, you know. Um, but we know that it's not true in the brain. 
Yeah, but even if there's different response rates, uh, I think a lot of the impact is still binary. Yeah, I agree. The, the, the power comes from the distributed representation, yeah, yeah. not from the scalar part of it. Yeah, because um, um, yeah, the scalar part, you still have to average over a second to get the fire rates, and it responds, yeah. the, the impact of the post-synaptic cell is going to be on a very small Yeah, percent. exactly. So it's right. a coincidence of inputs more than... That was, that was one of the rate observations rate. that drove our theory is that as soon as I point out, you can do all this really complex stuff in a single spike. They're not autonomous to the spikes. Therefore, there can't be any gradated degradation, not degradation, uh, radiation. Radiation? Radiation. You, <laughs> you can think of it as binary. But you can, you can do, you can do coincidence detection. Yeah, that, that's the distributed nature. Right. You right. get the coincidence of things. So, so the plain concept is a very crisp notion. Well, is it? We are struggling with it. I'm, I'm, I don't find it crisp at all. I'm really struggling with it. I mean, it, it's crisp in the sense that if you, you know, the definition in some sense is if you have a vector that's representing the synapses on that cell, mm -hmm. and you have a vector representing the input, if the dot product is greater than some threshold, that defines a plane right. in some sense. So uh, I was even struggling you could, to say You this. could do that in binary, too. But when you do it in binary, the concept of this, the visual input yeah, of the visual stuff, stuff doesn't important. make any sense. And then we have to this is where we have to define a plane more mathematically, because the idea of this sort of physical plane going through space makes no sense in a binary world. I'm just, I'm just wondering if, if it's, it's, it's any one particular one is binary, but you would want to pool these things to some degree so that you can, it, so it's not that crisp. When you say pool them. In, in other words, you know, what? The, the cortical columns being the adjacent ones saying, yeah, I got some response, I got some response. So you could, you could improve the both noise immunity and the ability to, to detect the finer gradations. In other words, yeah, it's yeah, I, I, think, I think that's a more important one. Um, as Pippa was pointing out earlier, if you have a distributed representation, so it's not one bit that you're looking at. You're looking at 50 bits that are on. Um, then the in individual quantization noise of any particular bit is not going to be very yeah, important. Yeah, exactly. Right. But what it would do is it, it, it would allow you to, in some sense, represent sub-quantal states, if you want to say that. But, but I, I think we've chosen up to now to try to ignore that as much as possible. That really complicates things. And if you think about it as binary, until we, until we can't anymore, um, but if you think about binary, it simplifies things tremendously. And if it still works, then we say, okay, we'll come back to the to the fact that it's not exactly binary in the future. Um, okay. We saw this. We really started running up against this for the first time when we were talking about grid cells, uh, and where in grid cells we ran into some hard boundaries in terms of like you can't get away with pure binary. You know, I can't remember exactly how we got that, but we got to that point where. It was, you had some real complicated arguments that were not going to I mean, in one sentence, anytime you want to integrate some continuous variable, the keyword integrating. When you're integrating some, some variable, you want um, something like a, gra a graded response. Yeah, yeah. So we'll get to that eventually. I, I, I'm hoping that all the arguments I made here today are independent of that completely. They're really more about the nature of the representation. Just like the spatial cooler is just a, a representation of the input space that we can get our heads around, we can understand what it means, we can manipulate it and work with it. Um, this idea gives me a, a representation of the motor command, which is derived from the Minicom, which is tied to the Minicom, which is really what Mountcastle's hypothesis was. The Minicom is the unit of processing. So now I can say, oh, each Minicom can define its own bit of sensory input and its own bits of motor output, and the set of them represents something meaningful. So that's, that you can do independent of whether the mini columns are slightly overlapping or binary. I think the same, the same uh, uh, intuitions can be understood in both those cases. I guess, I guess the thing with, with the binary is, is that my intuition says is, is that will be self purple Will be what? It, it's not as good as you think because of the because of the distributed nature. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, the distributed nature overcomes the binary. Yeah, binary. Well, that's the point. But, yeah. then, but then you're saying you know you still have to have a representation of it. The representation is the distributed representation. Right. Okay. In another way to think about it, not only do we do, you know not only do we do things in a single spike, 
but we do things with great loss. It, so the system is very robust to the uh, stochastic nature of the neurons and right. the cells. So, you know, the, the lots of observation has been that the individual synapses within neurons are not very reliable, and yet our system is reliable. Um, therefore, it, 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 it basically, that moves you away from this sort of very high resolution neural network type of thought to more of this binary, uh, more, more binary-like uh, representations. But if it's uh, distributed, then you're, you also have a great back in. You have to have cooling in order to make sense of that distribution, not in order to get it's not cooling. You don't have to cool You just have to always look at the distributed representation. Everything is, no neuron ever means, ever can be interpreted completely on its own. It always has to be in the distributed distribution. So if I go from, this, or I go from SDR to SDR to SDR, then I don't necessarily have to have pooling. I, I just, it's just, that's the way it is. It's just SDRs and both SDRs. And at any point in time, I can drop out any number of those bits along the way and the whole system keeps working. Even 40% of the bits can be dropped out and the whole system keeps working. Okay, but on one of these dendritic branches where you say you're trying to fight, you're inherently cooling at that point. I, mean, uh, I wouldn't use the word pooling for that. That's not how I would use the word pooling. Pooling is, uh, that, that's different for me. That's a different use of the word. So uh, that may be the problem here. You're, you're using the word differently than I, than I use it. Okay. Um, pooling to me is you have uh, multiple SDRs that are, that get converted into a single SDR. So that's pooling. Um, multiple input SDRs get mapped to a single spatial pool output SDR, or multiple um, input SDRs get mapped in, uh, over time in the through the temporal memory into a single output uh, name of the melody versus the melody. And, and that's a nephew to you? What's that? That's a nephew to you to, to have that assumption? No, no, it's, it's built into the system. Everything, the spatial oh, okay. pooler and temporal pooler are basically the whole idea is that you're doing that kind of pooling, but I wouldn't say the, the 20 bits on the, dendritic, on the dendritic segment aren't doing that. That's something different. They're not pooling um, so multiple SDR, they, in the sense of doing spatial pooling, if you want to consider it yeah, that way. Yeah. Okay, well, fine. Then they're doing spatial pooling in the same sense well, of the cost of temporal pooling. Too. They all have to, you know, some percentage have to fire. Pool. They're not doing temporal pooling. Temporal pooling means that, that uh, one SDR and another SDR that occurs over time, which are completely orthogonal SDRs, they don't have no overlap bits, get converted into the same output. And the dendritic segments, we don't have them doing that. The dendritic segments say, I just recognize a single pattern, and, and they, don't, they don't pool on that segment. I don't, the, the same dendritic segment doesn't, a moment later, represent a completely different SDR. All right. um, so I guess if you're saying, do, do the dendritic segments exhibit a spatial pooling type of operation similar to how the mini columns do? Yes, I would agree with that. But, we, we don't but there's, no there. there's no inhibition. There's no inhibition, there's no boosting, it's yeah. just, um, um, yeah. Yeah. It's it, yeah. It's missing some of the attributes of the spatial pooling. I mean, that's why we call it spatial pooling and temporal pooling because of pooling operations. Uh, it's, it's a bit tricky to get. I mean, the half is on the language of course. Anyway, we can end here. I know you guys have a lot to do. Um, the, the really the thing I would need help with is really coming up with a visual metaphor and the use of the term for planes or slices or, you know, is it a vector? Uh, these are. This is where I'm confused. I'm thinking about planes or something else, and um, um, so maybe that would be helpful for me to get some more insight on that. Um, that's it. That's today's ideas. Unless someone wants to ask more questions about it. All right. Going once. Going twice. Well, thanks. Well, thank you. Thanks for listening and helping. <laughs>